Okay, people, listen up. Let's be honest. Most of us look at work as a necessary evil in life. Labor is something we have to do to make ends meet. And we all know who to thank for that. This guy. Remember when God told Adam the ground is cursed because of him? And now everyone will have to toil in pain? Thanks a lot, Adam. Work is what it is. It may seem like a curse or a necessary evil, but in fact, it is part of God's plan for us. Genesis 2.15 explains that God placed man in the garden to maintain it. In other words, God always had plans for us to work in some form or fashion. On top of that, our work ethic is an opportunity to honor God. So God is a big fan of us working hard. However, God is also a big fan of us resting well. Before he created man and put him in the garden to work, God set the example for us. He worked hard and then he took time to rest. To make sure we followed his example, God initiated the Sabbath, a day set aside for rest. Exodus 16.23 says, Tomorrow is a time of cessation from work, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Mark chapter 6 shows us that Jesus encouraged his disciples to come away and rest a while. The simple truth is, God didn't create us to be human doings. He created us to be human beings. Sometimes we need to shut off our brains, shut off our bodies, stop doing and just be. So today, take a break from your toiling. Take an extended Sabbath, if you will. God is proud of your hard work. Now honor him by resting well. everyone and welcome to our Venture Church online experience. We are so happy that you're going to worship the Lord with us. Please sing with us. This is my prayer in the desert when all that's within me feels dry. This is my prayer in the fire, in weakness or trial or pain. There is a faith proved of more worth than gold, so refine me, Lord, through the flame. And I will bring praise, I will bring praise, no weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice. I will declare, God is my victory and he is here. And this is my prayer in the battle, when triumph is still on its way. I am a conqueror and co-heir with Christ, so firm on his I will bring praise, I will bring praise, no weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory and he is me. Season. 
Church. I'm honored that you've joined us today for the beginning of a brand new series that I'm calling Part of Something Big. Let me ask you a question. Do you think people desire to be part of something big? Do you think it, it inspires people, frightens people? I mean, how about you? The year was 1900. The famous explorer Ernest Shackleton was preparing for a journey to the South Pole. Now, not only was he going to need tons and tons of equipment, but he was going to need some top-notch men, men who would be willing to risk everything, risk their lives for the chance to be first to reach the South Pole. But how do you find such men? I mean, it's, it, it seemed like, well, obvious. Shackleton put an ad in the paper. In various newspapers throughout, un, throughout London, he placed this ad. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. Ernest Shackleton. Now, I mean, you got you to gotta ask yourself, you got to wonder, would anybody in their right mind respond to such an ad? to such a dangerous adventure? I mean, who would want to be part of something that big? Well, it turns out they did. Shackleton said it seemed as though all the men of Great Britain were determined to accompany him. Now, why? Why? Well, I think it's because God has wired all of us with a, with a deep and innate desire to be part of something big. The trouble is, most people just don't know how. Well, today we're beginning our own little epic journey, not to the South Pole, although this week in Phoenix, a little bit of South Pole might have been a blessing. We've been running upwards of 115 degrees all week long, but, but we're not going to the South Pole. What we're going to do over the next four weeks is we're going to take a deep look into the life of of the Apostle Paul, his life as revealed and recorded in the book of Acts. Now, hopefully what you're going to hear as we work our way through this story, what you're going to hear is God's invitation to be part of something big. Well, how big? Big. I mean, bigger than the South Pole, right? See, what's going to happen in the book of Acts is the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to be preached to the world. The Gentiles, for the first time ever, the Gentiles, that's us. We're going to be invited for the first time to be part of the family of Abraham, along with all the blessings and all the promises of Abraham. We're going to be part of something very, very big. Now, to, to lead this, this incredible outreach, this outreach to the Gentiles, God would put his finger on what you might call an unlikely candidate. Now, his name was Saul, and he was soon to become Paul. Now, by the time we, 
we encounter him in the book of Acts we, in chapter 7. A whole lot of things have happened. You, most of you know the stories. I want to encourage you this week, take some time and read through chapters 1 through 6, and, and you'll get up to date on, on the things that have happened. You know, Jesus' ascension, the, the, the day of Pentecost, uh, Peter's first sermon, all of those things. Get up to date on that. But by the time we come to chapter 7, what we're going to see is that persecution against the growing church is mounting. Stephen will be the first martyr of the Christian faith. But we will also, in chapter 7, meet for the very first time a young Pharisee, a young man named Saul. So if you're ready, let's get into it by turning to, to Acts chapter 7. And we're going to be, begin in verse 54, and I'd like to introduce to you I'd like you to meet Paul. Beginning in verse 54, the Bible says that when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, that is, Stephen's fiery sermon, they were furious and they gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and he saw the glory of God. Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him. They dragged him out of the city and they began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell on his knees. He cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And then in verse 8, and Saul approved of their killing him, cheering them on. And on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul, Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both women and men, and he put them in prison. So I, I want you to notice Saul's involvement in the death of Stephen. The, the witnesses who, according to Jewish law, were the ones that had to throw the first stones. They dropped their coats at, Stephen, at Saul's feet. But notice what he's doing. He's cheering them on. He's approving the killing of this, of this young Christian. But, but when it's all over, it's really just beginning for Saul because the persecution, he's absolutely zealous and committed to destroying this Christian movement. He hates Jesus and their followers and the church that's being founded. He goes from house to house. He drags both men and women and he puts them in prison. I mean, all we can say about him at this point he is a very, very bad man. I mean, it's a strange way to start our story, wouldn't you agree? I mean, this is the guy that's going to become the apostle to the Gentiles. Well, right now, he's the persecutor of the church. But, you know, here's, here's what I thought. If, if we were to extract a lesson from his life at this point, see, you can be sure Saul's convinced that he's doing the world a favor by killing these Christians. In fact, there probably isn't a more sincere soul anywhere. But Saul proves a point. He proves that we're all capable of being totally sincere and totally wrong. Totally wrong. Th think about it. Th think how many people today in our culture are extracting their theology from, from a podcaster or from a friend at school, or from a Hollywood star. In fact, it's becoming increasingly common, even for Christians, to act like it doesn't matter what you actually believe about God, as long as you're sincere. I mean, the culture says, you know, truth is what I determine it to be. But God says, no, sincerity is not the test of truth. Truth is the test of truth. Saul, the persecutor of the church, is a prime example that anyone and everyone can be both sincere and wrong at the same time. But what we, we've got to ask next, I mean, who is this guy, Saul? Well, what's making him tick? Why is he so angry? But most importantly, why in the world would God pick him 
to carry the message of the gospel. I mean, doesn't he seem to you like the last person on earth that, that should be preaching the gospel? Well, to answer these questions, I'd, I'd like to take you to the end of Paul's life. Now, we started in the chapter 7, which is the introduction to Saul. And now I want to take you to the conclusion of his life. And there he's going to offer a testimony, a testimony of his life that's going to give us some profound insight into who he is and why God called him. So when we arrive at, in Acts chapter 21, Paul is approaching his own martyrdom. He's about to be killed. He's about to become the persecuted. He's returned to Jerusalem for the last time. He's being arrested for preaching the gospel. And here's what happens in Acts 21, beginning in verse 37. As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, May I say something to you? Oh, do you speak Greek? He replied, the commander replied. I mean, aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the wilderness some time ago? Paul answered, no, I'm not that guy. He said, I'm a Jew. I'm from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Please, he said, let me speak to the people. So in verse 40, after receiving the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and he motioned to the crowd. And when everyone was silent, he said to them in Aramaic, he said, brothers and fathers, listen to my defense. And when they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. And then Paul said, I'm a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, Jerusalem. I studied under Gamaliel, and I was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as, jealous, as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women, throwing them into prison as the high priest and all the council themselves can testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. Paul's testimony, as, as he stands at the very end of his life, he gives us a powerful window into who he was. In fact, it, it's a profound picture. If you look at it, I, I would suggest to you today that it's a, prof a profound picture for exactly why God chose Paul to be his apostle to the, to the Gentiles. In fact, I'd like to offer you seven reasons, just very briefly, seven reasons from this passage why Paul was the perfect candidate to launch the Gentile outreach. Seven reasons why Saul, the enemy of Jesus, was just the man to become the apostle Jesus. He was the perfect choice. Reason number one, he was born in Tarsus. Now, Tarsus was the capital city, capital of Cilicia. Now, that, that's where modern-day Turkey is today. You see, to be born in Tarsus was, was a privilege. It was an incredible city. It was a cultural and an intellectual center. It was a highly respected Gentile city. To be born in Tarsus gave you immediate citizenship into Rome. Now imagine Paul as he travels through the Gentile world proclaiming the gospel. It, it would have been to no advantage to, to have been from Jerusalem. People from Jerusalem couldn't speak to Gentiles. But to be from Tarsus, a highly respected Gentile city, it gave, it gave Paul an immediate inroad, the perfect place to be from. But number two, it, it, gave, Peter, it gave Paul citizenship of Rome. He was a citizen of Rome. He, and that, did that help him? Of course it did. As, as Paul would travel throughout the Gentile region, his citizenship provided him incredible protections. It opened doors of opportunities. In fact, there were even times in his life when being a citizen of Rome saved his life. God knew that the apostle to the Gentiles would need to be a citizen of Rome. Number three, he was fluent in languages. 
Did you notice the languages that he spoke? He, he spoke to the commander in Greek. He, he couldn't believe it that this man was speaking to him. And when he turned then to, to speak to the crowd, he spoke in Aramaic. How's that possible? Well, he was from Tarsus. As a young man, he moved to Jerusalem and he studied law and philosophy in Jerusalem. Paul could speak the languages of the people, Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew. Imagine every place he traveled, he was fluent in the languages. He was the perfect candidate to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Number four, he studied with Gamaliel. Now, now Gamaliel was the most highly respected Pharisee of his day. He, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was honored by all the scripture says. In fact, in, in Acts chapter 5, there's a famous story where Gamaliel saves the day. Everyone respected him. So imagine Paul as he's, as he's preaching the gospel in these Gentile cities and he goes to the synagogues. No one wants to hear him until he says he was a student of the famous Gamaliel. It was an automatic inroad. He was the perfect choice to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Number five, he says that he was brilliant in the law. What does that mean? Well, he understood the law. He studied the law. He, he, he was taught to think. He was taught to reason. In fact, his keen mind, his brilliance, allowed him to bring a, a theological depth to his letters that we are still indebted to. He was the perfect choice. He was the man with the right brilliant mind for the job. Number six, he was zealous in his heart. See, Paul had zeal, whether it was for God or, or whether it was for chasing down his enemies. This was a young man that if something captured his heart, he worked hard at it every single day. In fact, the stories are all through Paul's many missionaries' journeys, relentless years of travel and preaching, hardworking zeal that he brought to the mission. He was the perfect candidate for the task. But finally, reason number seven why I would suggest to you that Paul was the perfect choice for the job. Number seven, he persecuted the church. He persecuted the church. Now, now you, you might say, no, that can't be the, the perfect reason. In fact, that seems like the reason why he couldn't be. But I would suggest to you that it was perhaps one of the strongest reasons that God chose the Apostle Paul. See, this unbelievable trans transformation that occurred in Paul's life, this unbelievable change from a, from a murderer to a, to a preacher, this unbelievable transformation communi communicated profound hope to those first believers. Imagine, imagine someone so evil, someone so wicked, if, if, if that person could change, if, if Saul could become Paul, then just think what else the gospel could accomplish in the world. Do you see how it must have encouraged the church? In fact, let me say it to you like this. If, if God's grace was big enough to turn Saul, the enemy of Jesus, into Paul, the apostle of Jesus, then nobody is beyond the saving power and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's exactly what Paul's life communicated to the church. Just imagine how exciting it must have been for these first Christians when they heard that Saul had become a believer you know, after picking themselves up off the floor in shock and awe, that they were filled with confidence. They were filled with hope in the power of the gospel. If, if Jesus could reach Saul, he could reach anyone. Everybody, everybody would have been eager to go and share the gospel, to tell the story to family and friends. And why not? If someone like Saul could be transformed, so could anyone. Well... I, I, I'm going to suggest to you that not only was the selection of Saul good for the church, but it was also good for him. Not only was it good for the church that he had been a persecutor, I think it was important in his life as well. I, I'm going to suggest to you that, that it was good for Paul because it helped solidify his theology of grace. The, the only way Paul could possibly make sense of his past. The only way he could deal with the horrific shame, the guilt, 
was the grace of God. And it was the message of grace that needed to be transported to the Gentile world. And, and Paul's painful past, it, it should have excluded him. But no, the grace of God transformed him in spite of his painful past. His wicked, evil past made him the perfect candidate to lead this entire movement as apostle to the Gentiles. I'd like to show you a verse. I'd like to show you a verse how Paul's painful past shaped his theology. In fact, he wrote it, he wrote it into one of his letters, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 9 through 10. It goes like this. Paul would write, I am the least of the apostles. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle. Why? Because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, he said, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet it was not I, but it was the grace of God that was with me. Do you see how this message of grace transformed the Apostle Paul's life? And it wouldn't have been possible without his painful experiences in the, in the past. His painful past helped him understand that it was the message of grace that the world needed to hear. The, the book of Acts is a profound story, an opportunity for us to be part of something big. You see, Jesus made it possible for us, the Gentiles, to, for us to be part of something big, something very, very big. We were to be included in the family of Abraham, a, a joint heir with Christ. All, all the blessings, every spiritual blessing in Christ can be ours. We can be born again. We can be sealed and filled with the Holy Spirit. Our sinful past, just like Paul, can be forgiven and forgotten. We can be adopted into the family with all the perks. We can have our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And one day, like Stephen, as he, as he gazed into heaven on the day of our death, we too will see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father, welcoming us home. And we will share an inheritance in glory. All of that is ours, available to us. We get to be part of something big. How? By the free gift, by the free gift of God's grace. See, the Bible says, whoever will call on the name of Jesus, whoever will come to him in humble repentance, faith, and trust, will be saved. Every one of us who come to him believing that he is who he said he was, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, whoever will believe in him will be saved. Jesus called these last days, these last days that began on the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago, the last days that, that the Apostle Peter proclaimed in his message. Jesus said these last days are called the times of the Gentiles. See, we're, we've been living for 2,000 years in this wonderful time of the Gentiles, a time when we too have been invited to be part of God's family, the family of Abraham, the seed of Abraham adopted into the family. We've been invited, but Jesus said one day the time of the Gentiles will be over and it'll be too late. You see, you and I are invited to be part of something big. There's nothing in your past that's stopping you. So what are you waiting for? Have you put your trust in him? Have you put your faith in Jesus? I'd like to invite you right now, wherever you are, to, to bow your head with me, to close your eyes. And, and if, if the Spirit of God has been speaking to your heart, if, if you've heard the invitation, the invitation of grace, the power of grace to transform your life. It's available. You can be part of something big today, but you have to take a step of faith. You have to believe. W would you do that today? Would you join me today in a prayer of faith? Bow your heads with me and pray. Al Almighty God, Lord Jesus, today I understand and I hear that the door is open 
that you've invited me with all of my brokenness and my sinfulness to be part of your family. I confess my sin. Humbly, I bow before you and I cry out to you, save me. Fill my heart with the Holy Spirit. I believe in Jesus and I'm going to follow you with all of my strength for the rest of my days. I trust you and I love you and thank you for making me part of the family. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer, I, I, the Lord bless you. We love you and we're grateful that you're on the journey with us. Make sure you're plugged into a church. Read your Bible, pray, walk with God, grow as a Christian and be one of His. Well, we love you and I'm looking forward to seeing you next Sunday as we continue our story of, of the Apostle Paul and we're going to watch his incredible conversion next Sunday. So the Lord bless you. Look forward to seeing you back here next week. Love you guys.